Welcome back to Module 7 and Chapter 7, where we're describing the solar system so that we're able to continue on to exoplanets and life in the universe. In this video, we'll be talking about the origin hypothesis for how our solar system came to be and how we have developed it based on observations of other systems. So let's start with the main things that we know about our own solar system that the model that we build has to account for. The first thing is that the main eight planets all orbit in the same flat plane with each other, and they all have roughly circular orbits. What that tells us is the material that they formed out of had already collapsed into a flat plane that was already moving with fairly circular um, orbits. Now near the sun, when we think about the inner planets that we introduced in the previous video, the inner four planets only have rocky material for the most part. Even Earth's oceans, they are not deep. Most of the mass that we have on Earth is rocky material. And we will talk about where the water came from anyway. Far away from the sun, when we look at the outer planets, they are much bigger. And that is because they have rocky material and they have icy material, so frozen water ice, frozen methane ice, lots of these additional materials that were not in solid form near the sun that allows them to get bigger. And any model that we come up with has to make sure that as we model things through time, that the solar system that it describes is at least 4.5 billion years old because we have those numbers from radioactive dating. And as a reminder from the previous video, I said this too, we do not need to understand for our particular curriculum, we do not need to understand the inner workings of how radioactive dating works because the one thing it comes up for in our curriculum is to make sure we know how we have a number value age of the solar system. Okay, so the solar nebula model is the current leading explanation that accounts for all of the evidence on the previous slide, as well as observations that we have of other star systems. Now the big picture idea is that um, if we think about the word nebula, we learned it back in chapter 20, it's basically the way to describe a cloud of gas and dust, and the solar nebula model is basically saying that our entire system came from a large cloud of gas and dust that collapsed. In the same way that we've already talked about star formation, planets can also form during this process. So we're going to add to our understanding now. The other thing to point out is just like we talked about star formation back in module 5, this is something that we can look at other systems to get snapshots of their process of forming the stars and any additional material. The extra material flattens out into what's called a protoplanetary disk. I may have used that term already in module five when we talked about chapter 21. And that additional material is the gas and dust that can eventually form planets. We can describe the entire solar nebula model with these four simplified steps. It is certainly more complicated and there are things that are still unknown about some of the inner workings, but for our purposes, these basic four steps are all we really need. We have a cloud of gas and dust that is caused to collapse, the same way that we talked about for star formation. As that cloud of gas and dust shrinks, because of how physics works, conservation of angular momentum, lots of other things going on, it flattens out. That disk of material then is able to have a concentrated object near the center, that's the proto-sun, and then other material out in the disk. That material starts to form grains and then pebbles and then rocks that can eventually build themselves up and those become what are called planetesimals, the building blocks of planets. Think about it kind of like a whole bunch of Legos. Now we actually have pieces we can build with. All right, now the sun is mostly hydrogen and helium. It has about 2% other stuff. However, when we look at what Earth is made of, it is mostly that 2% of other stuff. 
the gas, the hydrogen and helium gas, was able to concentrate and form the sun. And the stuff that was left over in the disk was the heavier material for the most part. Um, and the stuff that formed solids, like the leftover dust from the nebula. Now, all of the listed objects here um, on this particular slide, we do not need to memorize. But what it is currently listing is the temperature range where these things are solid. And the top is not describing the physical distance to scale, but it is showing the temperature where each of those objects formed. So, to be clear, Mercury, when it formed, the space in the nebula at that time had a temperature of about 1200, 1300 degrees. Extremely hot, where really only metals and iron nickel were fully solid. And some silicate materials, silicates are what we tend to think of as rocks. When we get to Earth, the temperature at Earth's formation point was somewhere around 700 Kelvin. And there were more of these rocky type objects to build with, and we see those here on Earth. The most important thing, because we do not need to memorize these fancier terms, this is from chapter 14 and it's well beyond our um, curriculum. The thing that is important for us to recognize is water, ammonia, and methane are solid at very cold temperatures and otherwise they are in gas form in space. When we think of water, we think of, you know, liquid water that we have in water bottles. Or we think of ice cubes. That's the solid idea. And then if we think about boiling a pot of water, the steam above that water is gas in, um, is water in gas form. The problem in space is that because the pressure is very low, almost zero in space, a vacuum, right? Water can't actually be in liquid form in space. So what happens is it is either solid or gas. That will be something that comes up too when we talk about comets, which have a lot of solid water ice, and when they get near the sun, they create a gas tail. Okay, so back to this idea. What we're really seeing is the fact that the inner planets formed at temperatures too hot to have these ices available as building blocks. And all of the outer four planets had more building blocks available to them. When the inner planets formed at these really high temperatures, they stay small because they use up all their Legos and then they're done. Farther away, we get a point that's called the ice line, and it's somewhere in between Mars and Jupiter where temperatures are cold enough that now we have rock and ices available, more Legos to build with, we get bigger objects, and, very important, there's hydrogen and helium gas all throughout the disk, but you need to have a strong enough gravity to hold on to it. Jupiter and Saturn built big enough cores of rock and ice to take in a lot of hydrogen and helium. And when we compare the mass of Jupiter with Earth, that big difference comes not just from having ices available, but by reaching that threshold where now we can sweep up the gas itself too and start to form gaps in the disk of material. The picture here on the left is a real image of a forming star. And each of those gaps is basically showing us a planet that is forming and sweeping up all the material around it. And zooming in on that inner part of the solar system, we're seeing a planet similar to Earth sweeping up all the stuff in a particular region as it forms. Kind of cool. So the inner planets and outer planets, the reason they look so different from each other as two separate categories is entirely because of that temperature difference, where by having more stuff to build with, the outer planets could become larger and could sweep up hydrogen gas quite easily. 
And if we think about it, the dwarf planets, which we will see further on in our slides in this module, not in this um, video, the dwarf planets are all small icy objects. For the most part, they're all four of them smaller than our own moon that orbits Earth. And these small icy objects, they aren't forming in this same exact way. They are so far from the sun that the density was low enough that they just didn't have a lot of building blocks to begin with, whether it's rock or ice or whatnot. And they didn't get a chance in that formation process to build very big. And because all of their orbits are weird and tilted like this, what it's telling us is that they probably didn't form with those orbits necessarily, and they were captured either from outside the solar system or they were got too close to each other and kind of kicked into a new, um, more tilted and elongated orbit. Okay. So I want us to try to process what we've just introduced. So a pause and think question for us. Which of the following types of planets would form in the early solar system at locations hot enough for water molecules to exist only as a gas? So take a moment and think about that. Okay. So the answer here is option one, because what this is asking is where are planets forming where they don't have ices available to build with. They don't have enough building blocks. And the inner planet stayed small because they didn't have water ice to build with and other ices. So option one here. We will see some more activities to help us think about the solar system um, formation and to think about the introduction to the solar system as a whole, including supplementary videos that go through in a um, kind of fun way, some of the basic facts about each planet. But like I said at the beginning of the module, we are not spending a lot of time sort of learning a bunch of random disconnected facts about Jupiter and learning a bunch of random disconnected facts about Neptune, because that doesn't really help us build the bigger picture understanding or the creative thinking that we want in a class where we have more time to develop our understanding of the solar system, like a solar system specific course where we have a whole semester to work on it, we would definitely go into those because it helps us be able to compare and contrast planets within our solar system and outside our solar system. We just don't have that focus here for our introductory course. So in the next video, we will be seeing Earth as an example planet in the same way that we saw the sun as an example star. And then we will be moving on to a kind of brief tour through our solar system and other systems beyond it. I will see you in those next videos.